Today is August 18th, 2010. We're at the beautiful Hyatt Regency, Maui. We are here today to interview Judge Susan Malway. Uh, in a brief video, oral history to supplement a longer, more complete audio oral history. I'm Rita Hausler, and I'm here on behalf of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. How did you decide to become a lawyer? I had a very uh, unorganized path to the law. I actually had thought the law was not what I wanted to do. My father is a lawyer, and that's usually a cure for the children. And I thought for sure I would do um, I thought I would teach. I, I have a master's degree in English literature. I thought I'll go and get my doctorate and I'll do that. Um, but um, I was surrounded by people who had decided to switch from English into law and it seemed exciting. And I also knew that people who got PhDs in English literature had only a one in three chance of using their PhD. And so I thought, well, I'll just follow the crowd and I'll, I'll, I'll go to law school and, you know, I'll see how it goes. And then I went to law school and I never left the law. Before you went to law school, you spent some time working, using your degree in English literature. I did. What, yes. what did you do? Well, I got a master's in English, which at that time was the highest level of English literature degree offered at the University of Hawaii, where I was. And I then became a full-time instructor on the faculty um, in the Department of English at the University of Hawaii, and I taught college uh, freshmen and sophomores the required courses. And then I went off to Japan on an adventure, and I lived in Tokyo for three and a half years, and I did teach not literature, but language um, there at a university there. And I also um, edited books. They were in English, but they were about Asia and the Pacific. It was very good training for me and from there I went to law school and my training now has just been in the context of law. My, my English training, my use of it has just been in the context of law. You mentioned that your father uh, what was or perhaps yes. is a lawyer yes. and that it tends to have a negative consequence. I know that's true for my children. Um, did he end up being a mentor and a role model to you? Well, you know, um, I talked to him all the time about legal things, but um, because I went into law so late, um, you know, I was an adult, I was married by that time, and um, he actually wasn't that involved in my decision to become a lawyer. Not directly involved, I'm sure there was a huge indirect impact, but not directly involved. And then after I became a lawyer, um, I was a commercial litigator and that just overtook everything and I had to spend all my time there. And I found that, um, you know, as I get older, and he's older too, he's, um, he's 85 and he still does handle some legal work. Um, and I told him recently, I said, you know, I just appreciate you more and more now the older we get. And so I, I really do feel his influence more every year. What about your mother? Was she an influence on your career? My mother was definitely an influence. My mother was super mom. Um, at a time when lots of women in her generation did not work, she worked outside of the home. I grew up in a family of six children. Amazingly, you know, my mother made breakfast for all of us every morning and dinner every night, but you know, I, I don't know who does that in my generation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she would sew my my Halloween costume and my prom dress, my wedding gown, she made that for me. And um, she's super mom, and she's 85 now too, and actually she's not um, in the best of health, but um, she, she's a huge influence on me. I, I feel deficient in every way next to her. Did do you credit her with giving you the, uh, the compassion that you, you definitely exercise on the bench? Well, my mom, um, hmm. My mama is a very compassionate person. She's also, you know, pretty strong-willed. I don't, I, I think maybe I got stubbornness from her. <laughs> well, stubbornness is a good quality too. Sometimes it, it is, you going. sometimes. Definitely. Uh, other than your parents, uh, who were your role models in terms of choosing a, a law career? 
Well, my brothers and sisters actually had a huge influence on me that they don't even know they had. Um, none of them went into law, but they all were constantly, we constantly challenged each other growing up. And there's a 14 year age span between the oldest, I'm the second, and the youngest. And, um, you know, we were a noisy bunch and we did hang around a lot together. So they had a huge influence on me. Um, Hawaii is a small community, so people who grow up here often have friends who were their friends from childhood, and I have such friends, I'm really lucky, and those people had a, a big influence on me. And once I went into law, um, the people at the law firm that I entered, right out of law school and that I stayed in until I went on the bench, had a huge influence on me. I'm so grateful to the partners who trained me when I was an associate, to the, my, my fellow partners when I became a partner, and to my friends, many of whom I still uh, am very close to, and I recuse myself from their cases, um, but I've kept that, and that has been a huge influence on me. And there are lots of judges that I admired. Um, I was lucky enough to try a case in front of the outgoing Chief Justice for the state of Hawaii, Ron Moon. Um, he was at that time a trial judge. I, I felt really privileged to have a trial in front of him because he was a legendary trial attorney. Um, I, I do very clearly recall how impressed I was with the late Martin Pence, um, who um, by the time I went on the bench was a senior district judge, and he was um, on the bench into his 90s. And he left a huge impression on me because he was so smart and he was so experienced that when you appeared before him, um, you knew you were getting a well-prepared, uh, seasoned uh, judge who was gonna have a lot of common sense and be pretty direct with you, and I really did appreciate that. How did you decide once you graduated law school which path to take, whether it was gonna be private or public? Um, I knew I wanted to be a litigator, and um, I don't know that I made that conscious a choice. I had debt um, coming out of law school and the firm that I went to happened to come up and recruit and gave me a job so I actually felt quite lucky um, to go into such a wonderful firm and uh, I didn't know that I would stay there that long but I loved it. I loved the people there. I loved the excitement of the practice so it just kind of ended up that I stayed there. Okay, and you mentioned that you were married before you went to law school. I was. I, um, I got married when I was only 22, um, and we were married for a long time. I got divorced four years ago, so I was, um, that was, um, it was over 30 years that we were married. We're still good friends. Um, my ex-husband is a lawyer, too, and went to law school at the same time, and we have one son um, who is 19, and he's a uh, going into his sophomore year at NYU, studying music, so um, he's still a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go into my kids. Uh, <laughs> that must have been very stressful, though, going to law school and starting a you know, pretty challenging legal career while married. Well, um, I, I, I think I was fortunate that um, I was going through it at the same time. So my former husband went to law school at the same time as I did. It did mean we both had lots of debt because we were putting ourselves through, but we also each knew what the other was doing. Um, we understood what was going on in each other's jobs, so I actually think that was a benefit for us. Okay. In, in your commercial practice, can you tell us a little bit about the cases that you handled? Um, as the years went on, I started to take on a fair amount of um, trademark and copyright litigation, which I really enjoyed. Um, but we actually didn't have that great specialization in my old firm. So I had some employment discrimination, a lot of um, commercial litigation, lender liability and that sort of thing. Um, we, everybody there did some construction litigation. So it was a, a really wide range. And I know in some larger firms, you know, they specialize environmental and so forth. And actually, my old firm has more of that specialization now than it used to. But when I was there, um, we did a little of everything, insurance coverage disputes and so forth. We actually handled the gamut of civil litigation. Is there any case that stands out, something really memorable from that time? 
Well, let's see. I can think of two. Okay. Um, one was a trademark dispute. Those so rarely go to trial. This one went to about a month-long jury trial. I was a nominee for a federal district judgeship at the time, and I had consented to trial in front of a magistrate judge, and so that, you know, created an issue, and he had to assure himself that he wasn't going to defer to me, and trust me, he didn't. <laughs> um, and then... And that was a very exciting case because there were so many areas that we couldn't find law on because not that many cases get tried. Um, so that was an exploration constantly. But the other case I can think of is a case I inherited from one of my partners who got ill. Um, and that was a case that went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. It was... Um, an employment discrimination lawsuit, but the issue that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court was on a preemption issue. And I got to argue in front of the Supreme Court. That was really exciting. My client prevailed. Um, so that was, that was a very memorable case for me. That was my only one, after all, that went up that high. Yeah, it's pretty unusual to get to the U.S. Supreme Court. What, what was the, obviously you won, were you on the, the plaintiff side? I, or was, the I did side? represent the employee, yes. Um, and, and he was a mechanic who had repaired a plane, um, and then he was asked to certify some, one of the um, alleged repairs, and he said that the, the repair was not complete and there were problems with the plane, and he was fired, and he claimed that that was wrongful, that he had reported a problem and was being fired even though he had reported what he said was uh, an illegal certification of the plane as flightworthy. And the issue was whether he really could come into court um, with such a claim or whether he had to grieve it through the process. And we, we did get a ruling that he was allowed to come into court. Well, all of those who fly, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <It's> scary. <laughs> On the trademark case, what was the main issue? Uh, this actually is a supermarket chain that, even though we won this case, um, no longer exists here. They've sold it but it was a local supermarket chain. It was called Star Markets, and um, we sued Texaco because Texaco had put in these convenience stores at um, gas stations, and the convenience stores were called Star Mart. And so our concern was that customers thought that they were going to some branch of Star Market and that if there were problems with the goods that they purchased there, they, they confused the source of those goods as coming from Star Market. So Star Market uh, brought a lawsuit seeking to enjoin the use of that, and we went to trial, and we did get an injunction, and then um, there were damages, but we settled after we won on the, um, the main issue. So the damages had still been left, the, the, the punitive damage issue, I'm sorry, we, we got damages. And then there was a punitive damage issue, which had been bifurcated out, and we settled. Yeah, you're right. Those, it's very unusual for those cases to go to yes. trial because they usually decided at the preliminary injunction right, stage. Right, right. So we did have a kind of preliminary injunction, but um, there were still issues to be resolved. Okay. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Yeah, no, obviously had a stubborn opponent there. Who well, it was Texaco. Yeah. They, they, they can afford to go to trial. I would have told them to settle that case right <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> but it sounds like a great long trial. It's incredible. How did you decide to go on the bench? You know, I'm going to sound so stupid because it's, again, very unorganized. But um, a number of people suggested when there was a vacancy that I might want to put my name in. And I dismissed the thought because I knew that this kind of position is a political appointment and I had not um, had the kind of political involvement I thought was necessary to get such an appointment. But once that idea was planted, I thought, well, I didn't think I had much to lose by putting my name in, so I did so. And um, in our district at that time, there was not what we now have. And what we had had some years earlier, which was a merit selection panel for the federal bench. And instead, our senators would take in applications and interview people, and then they had a practice of making a short list and sending that to the White House. And that's what happened. 
there was a short list of four people and um, Senator Inouye called me to tell me I had made it onto the list and I actually didn't believe him. I, I didn't believe it was Senator Inouye. And so when he called, I, I said, who is this? And this is really not funny. And he has a very distinctive voice and he assured me that this was Daniel Inouye and he would never make a joke about something so serious. And I, I just had a mental image of my name getting deleted from the short list, but somehow it stayed on and I eventually got this, but I actually had to wait um, a very long time to be confirmed, very long. So I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and we're glad you're here too. You, you, you said you didn't feel that you had been engaged enough in the political process right. and yet you had a, a history of advocacy and pro well, bono work. Not political though, and I thought that that was what was needed. Um, and actually I had been on the board of the Hawaii American Civil Liberties Union and that created um, some reaction when I was nominated and I became the symbol of um, uh, whatever somebody didn't like about anything the ACLU had done. And at that time actually Hawaii was in the forefront of the same-sex marriage debate and the ACLU had supported that. And although I had not personally been involved in the issue, I, I became the embodiment of that position. And so I, um, I didn't get confirmed when um, initially people thought I would. I went for a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. Everybody else in my group went on and got confirmed, and I didn't. And my nomination lapsed, and I had to be renominated after President Clinton had been reelected, um, and then I had to go back for a second Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, um, and you know you pay your own way, you know. And so um, I remember my parents the first time I had paid for them to come up in my family, and we all laughed and we said, "Well, it's expensive, but it's once in a lifetime." And then when I went another time, I said, "Well, it's twice in a <laughs> lifetime." Um, but eventually I did get confirmed. It took me about um, two and a half years from my first nomination until I got confirmed. But I'm grateful to be here no matter how long 